Just so you all know, this will be recorded tonight and it will be available um, in the next few days on um, Wofford's um, ODI website. So, thank you all for attending tonight. My name is Dr. Rhiannon Liebrich and I'm a, an assistant professor of sociology at Wofford College. Tonight, three student researchers, Aaliyah Harris, De'Aaron McGowan, and Destiny Shippey will discuss the culmination of a 10-month research project titled Acknowledging Our Past, Race, Landscape, and History, funded by a grant from the Council of Independent Colleges and by the Wofford Office of Undergraduate Research. I will first give a brief overview of our research methods and goals. Then I will introduce each student researcher. The students will then present their findings. We will reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes tonight for questions from the audience. If you have a question, we request that you please send it to me using the chat tool below, and I will ask this, these questions to the students in a panel format at the end of their presentations. The booklet of our research is shared in the chat below as a PDF you all can download. Physical copies will be available at the beginning of next semester. If you would like to request a free print copy, please send an email to libricra at wofford.edu. I've also posted that in the chat below. Before we get started, we would like to read the following land and labor acknowledgement. We will then take a 30 second moment of silence to recognize the individuals who helped build and maintain our campus and everyone who has been affected by individual, institutional, and systemic racism on this campus, in our community, and across the globe. So the Land and Labor Acknowledgement. This was co-authored by Dr. Cynthia Fowler and Dean Taifa Alexander. This research has been produced at an institution of higher learning located in a space where Native American communities have lived and worked for thousands of years. We especially acknowledge the Cherokee peoples who were associated with this space during the early colonial era. We also honor with gratitude the enslaved Africans who labored to lay the physical foundation of the college and have contributed to its development for 166 years. As a result, we commit to actively engage in learning how to be better caretakers of this place and continue to honor the history of indigenous and enslaved peoples and their descendants. So we'll now take a 30 second moment of silence. We're taking a moment of silence. We're taking a moment of silence. Oh, <laughs> All right, thank you all very much. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a very brief timeline. And then after um, we go over the timeline of our research, I will have, um, I will turn it over to our student researchers. And Destiny, De'Aaron, or Leah, would you all mind, I just realized I can't simultaneously have my screen up. Would you all mind just pulling up the research methods page? One of you all. I can do it. Thank you, Aaliyah. So we'll give you a picture from our booklet to look at while I read. One second. Sorry, <laughs> took a while. Okay. Okay, 
So in January 2020, student researchers trained in archival research uh, methods and oral history during interim. So uh, two of the students who will be here tonight um, and a few others, which I'll talk about, um, the students also read and discussed a wide array of peer reviewed articles and books related to public memory, commemoration, memorialization, and racial violence, including material on the emotional labor involved in this type of work. In addition, students planned and led a roundtable discussion with community members at the public library about potential research directions and to hear their feedback before beginning this project. The students, Dr. Camille Bethay and I took a field trip to study and learn from commemorative sites of racial violence and injustice in Montgomery, Alabama, including the Civil Rights Memorial, the Legacy Museum, From Slavery to Mass Incarceration, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and the Freedom Rides Museum. In spring 2020, Keisha Best and Aaliyah Harris spent the semester researching the Wofford College archives and special collections, digging through boxes of materials, scanning items, and utilizing the archives at the public library, consulting with the college archivist, Dr. Philip Stone, and the special collections librarian, Mr. Luke Moore, and conducting oral histories. Keisha and Aaliyah also presented their preliminary findings to Teach Equity Now. And if you can skip ahead, you could see a picture of them at work. Or here's our research team. And I think if you skip ahead to the next, here's our town hall. There's a picture of Aaliyah doing work with Mr. Luke Moore. Um, over the summer, Destiny Shippey and De'Aaron McGowan joined the research team. And we created this booklet, which is available to you all as a PDF, as well as a series of forthcoming teaching modules for Wofford FYI. And those will come out next year. Students also presented their work at the new faculty orientation. Our research goals for this project were to better understand the history of anti-Black racism and its various manifestations on our college's campus, to explore what history has been preserved and how it has been told and what has been minimized, ignored, or left out of the historical narrative about our school, to begin to highlight the lived experiences and histories of those who have been erased from our campus's public memory, acknowledging that what is not recorded tells a great deal about how systemic racism and other forms of discrimination are maintained, to learn more about resistance to survival of and resilience under white supremacy, and to begin the process of acknowledging and reflexively reckoning with our school's past so that we can start to repair harm and move toward a more equitable, regenerative, and inclusive campus community. We hope that at the conclusion of this research project, because these students have begun addressing our past, the institution will be in a better position to join and build upon the conversations already happening in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and at colleges and universities throughout the United States about the lingering and current effects of slavery and other forms of systemic racism on our campus today. Without further ado, I would like to now introduce the three student researchers who will be presenting tonight. Um, I'm first going to introduce Aaliyah Harris and Keisha Best, who unfortunately is not here tonight, or not presenting tonight, who were the two lead researchers this past spring. Aaliyah Harris is a junior from Cincinnati, Ohio, double majoring in English and Sociology and Anthropology. Aaliyah is treasurer of the Wofford Women of Color and the Association of Multicultural Students, as well as a participant in other organizations on campus. She is, also, she is also a member of the women's basketball team and has plans to pursue a career in law. Aaliyah's research focused on Wofford's early faculty and administration and the college's involvement in the Civil War. Keisha, who graduated this past spring, so will not be presenting tonight, but I do want to recognize her work, um, graduated in spring, was a sociology and anthropology major and business minor. Keisha received the Jerry Ginocchio Award for Outstanding Sociology Anthropology Senior, which recognizes academic excellence, sociological imagination, and anthropological perspective. Keisha also won the Curry B. Spivey Award, which is given to the member of the college community whose work in the area, area of volunteerism has been exemplary. Keisha is currently pursuing an MBA at Fayetteville State University and is not able to present tonight. 
De'Aaron and Destiny joined the research team this summer and were instrumental in exploring the past 50 plus years of Walker's history. De'Aaron McGowan is a junior from Greenville, South Carolina, majoring in finance. De'Aaron currently serves as a member of the COVID Student Response Leadership Team, and she is a member of Campus Union's Student Experience Committee. For the summer research project, De'Aaron's work focused mainly on integration at Wofford and the decade that followed. Destiny Shippey is a junior from Spartanburg, South Carolina, majoring in sociology and anthropology. Destiny is current president of both the Wofford Anti-Racism Coalition and Wofford Women of Color. While participating in several organizations on campus, Destiny is also a member of Wofford's track and field, the Wofford track and field team. Destiny's contribution to this research focused on Wofford's history taking place from 1980 until present day. I also want to thank Vera Oberg and Bryson Coleman who worked on this project during interim. Now I will hand it over to Aaliyah who is going to begin the research presentation portion. So thank you again all for being here. Good evening. Um, like Dr. Liebrich said, my name is Leah Harris. I'm a junior. Um, I'm first just going to start by introducing some of the key findings um, from our research. So basically, archival data shows that early Wofford leaders, like many of their peers at other academic institutions, were pro-slavery in their written work and speeches, and they had ties to well-known anti-abolitionist and pro-slavery leaders. Um, many early Wofford leaders were slave owners, including college founder Benjamin Wofford and um, some of the first presidents, William Whiteman, um, Ship, and Carlisle. As well as um, members of the early board of trustees and some early faculty. Um, Wofford's earliest buildings, Maine, and the five original faculty houses were constructed by enslaved people and some Wofford alumni participated in and supported racial violence during and after the reconstruction period. Wofford College as an institution was complicit with segregation and Jim Crow laws and integration at Wofford was contentious among the student body, alumni, administration and faculty. Black students faced overt racism on campus during this period. <clears throat> so Wofford's founding, um, basically Wofford College opened its doors on August 1st, 1854 because of the vision and an $100,000 donation from Benjamin Wofford. Um, Benjamin Wofford settled in South Carolina with his first wife, Anna Todd, on her family's land near the Tiger River. Anna Todd is said to have planted in Wofford's mind his interest in education and upon the deaths of Anna Todd's parents, the couple inherited their property at the time. Local laws meant that ownership of the wife's personal property in the management, but not ownership of her real estate and the control of its income belonged to her husband. The couple had no children and Anna Todd died. I wanted to mention Anna Todd because there was originally a building named after her that's since been torn down. And that was one of the only buildings on campus named after a woman and now it no longer exists. Um, Wofford's will shows that he owned eight enslaved people at the time of his death in 1850. Their names were Bafset, Virginia, Frank, Jack, and a couple named Bell and Winey, and their two children, Co Coleman and George. And public records also indicate that Wofford also owned an enslaved man named John in 1827. John was accused of having a relationship with a white woman and he was then executed. And afterwards, Wofford wrote a handwritten note to the state requesting compensation for John. Um, these are just two pages from Wofford's will. Um, so the construction of the school. The trustees retained one of the state's leading architects, Edward C. Jones of Charleston, to design the college's main building. Um, construction of Maine began in the summer of 1852 under the, under the supervision of Ephraim Clayton of Asheville, North Carolina. The 1850 census shows that Clayton owned several in seven enslaved people. In 1860, he owned 11 slaves and also had several freemen working for him. Um, Clayton like, likely had his slaves and the freemen who worked for him help construct main building. It is also likely that he rented enslaved people from local residents. And at least one person did die helping build main building when the Western Tower collapsed on him. 
um, The Thinking Men. This poem is located in Main Building. In 2008, poet Nikki Finney presented her poem, The Thinking Men, at Wofford College to commemorate the enslaved men who worked to build early campus structures, including Main Building. Finney said she wanted to illustrate with her poem that even though no one knows the names of the slaves who worked on the main building, they are distinguished by the care they took with their work. Finney says she believed that the enslaved workers realized that someday people who looked like them would attend the college and obviously that dream did come to fruition. <clears throat> so early Wofford, the first days of classes, Wofford College had seven students in the first year and sophomore classes. By the end of that year, the total was 24 students. Most early students boarded with families in the town of Spartanburg. However, some students were allowed to occupy empty recitation rooms on campus. William Whiteman. William Whiteman was born in 1808 and he became the president of Wofford College after serving on the board of trustees. He joined the South Carolina Annual Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1828 and served appointments over the next six years. In 1839, he returned to South Carolina and in the summer of 1840, he became the editor of the Southern Christian Advocate. He served for more than 10 years as editor. Whiteman became a leading member of the South Carolina Annual Conference. He was first elected a delegate to the General Conference in 1840. He was a member of the 1844 conference that saw the American Methodist Church split into Northern and Southern branches based on, their, on the argument of slavery. So the Northern sector of the church was pro-abolition and wanted to see slavery be ended, but obviously the Southern branch was against this and this caused the split. Um, <clears throat> as the editor of the Southern Christian Advocate, he worked closely with William Capers, an outspoken advocate for the continuing of slavery. And this is obvious if you look at some of those old Southern Christian Advocate records, you can see some of William Capers work and just how obvious he was in his um, desire to continue slavery. Um, articles within the Southern Christian Advocate supported the institution of slavery and encouraged the conversion of all slaves to Methodism through the work of preachers and missionaries. Some even said that a good slave can only come if they were Christian and just like rhetoric like that. Um, Wofford College was a regular advertiser in the um, Southern Christian Advocate and many of the early professors and later presidents held prom prominent positions at the journal, including Dr. Herman Baer, Albert M. Shipp, and John Carlisle. <clears throat> the Civil War. During the Civil War, the Citadel and Arsenal cadets were encamped on Wofford's campus and at least one Confederate soldier died in a makeshift infirmary and Professor, I believe, did I skip a slide? Sorry. Um, during the Civil War, Citadel and Arsenal cadets were encamped on, the Woff on Wofford's campus and at least one Confederate soldier did die in a makeshift infirmary in Professor Carlisle's home. Um, the college was able to maintain itself financially because of tuition from the Wofford Fitting School. Um, originally, there was like a preparatory school that was associated with Wofford and like younger boys attended there. However, the college did struggle financially after the war because so much of its money was invested in Confederate war bonds. And we actually have one of those Confederate war bonds in the library. Joseph Hamilton was a graduate of Wofford College and was a commander of the Blue Ridge Rifles, a military unit of the Confederate Army that began as the Southern Guard ROTC Group, which is still the name of the ROTC Group at the college currently. Um, at least 35 students or former students um, of Wofford College died during the war. There was a plan to build a Confederate monument at Wofford and funds were raised for this. Um, however, the monument never came to fruition. <clears throat> Albert M. Shipp. So Shipp became the president of Wofford College in 1859 after serving on the board of trustees from 1851 through 1853. Shipp was the president during the Civil War when Wofford was the only college that remained open in South Carolina. And by 1862, there were only eight students enrolled. Many of the students at the time pressured President Shipp to let them join the war effort, but the governor would not initially would not allow it, saying that they would need educated men in the South after the war to just kind of restructure um, the South because so many men will have died fighting in, um, the war efforts. And during this time, the Board of Trustees invested $85,897 into Confederate war bonds and the school nearly went bankrupt because of this. Um, Ship co-owned enslaved people according to the 1850 census, including Tobias Hartwell, 
who is a very prominent figure in Spartanburg history. Um, if you want to do your own research on Tobias Hartwell, he definitely contributed a lot to Spartanburg after he was granted his freedom. Um, Ship owned 22 enslaved people, and this is shown in the 1860 slave schedule. Um, in 1963, Wofford College named a newly constructed dormitory, the AM Ship Hall. This is still the name of a dorm hall, of the current dorm hall on campus right now. <clears throat> Tobias Hartwell. Um, Tobias Tobe Hartwell was born into slavery around 1840 in Virginia, and records show that he was brought to Spartanburg in 1859 by Dr. A.M. Ship. In 1874, Hartwell purchased over two acres from R.E. Cleveland to build a three-room home on East Cleveland Street in Spartanburg. He worked for 33 years for the National Bank of Spartanburg and died in 1932. And in 1940, the Spartanburg Housing Authority opened the first public affordable housing property called Toe Partwell Courts. The Reconstruction Period. So from 1865 to 1877, um, this is called the Reconstruction Period. And during this post-emancipation period, Black leaders joined white allies to bring the Republican Party to power with the intention of redefining governance and making power more equitable. And in the years after the Civil War, Black codes were adopted by Southern states to control Blacks and to reimpose the white supremacist social structure. Southern legislatures passed laws that severely restricted the civil rights of emancipated former slaves, for example, for example labor contracts and vagrancy laws. Reconstruction. Um, the wartime letters of Wofford alumni Dick and Tally Simpson, both Confederate soldiers, were turned into a book. Um, Dick Simpson was an avid supporter of the Red Shirts during and after Reconstruction, and the Red Shirts were an armed group, were an armed white supremacist group or rifle club who used violent tactics, intimidation, and terror to prevent Black men from voting. They are one of the first white supremacist groups in the country. Um, the Red Shirts supported Wade Hampton's third gubernatorial campaign, campaign, and Hampton was one of the largest slaveholders in the region and leader of a group committed to restoring white supremacy called the Redeemers. He later became a U.S. Senator. The Red Shirts were also the instigators behind the 1876 Ham Hamburg Massacre, in which six Black men were murdered. Documented lynchings. Um, according to the Equal Justice Initiative, there were at least 189 reported lynchings of African Americans in South Carolina between 1877 and 1950. Two of those were in Spartanburg. Abe Thompson was lynched on March 3rd, 1886 in a grove on Main Street about a half a mile from the courthouse. And Ike Anderson was lynched on December 20th, 1893 for intimacy with a white woman. Um, there were over 4,000 reported lynchings in the U.S. during this period. James Carlisle. James Carlisle served as the third president of Wofford College from 1875 to 1902. After previously working as a professor um, since 1854, he was president during the Reconstruction period and in the years that followed. Carlisle was a member of the South Carolina Secession Convention in 1861 and is one of the original signatories of South Carolina's Secession Declaration. Um, James Carlisle is highly regarded in South Carolina. A lot of media actually claims him to be one of the greatest men to ever come out of South Carolina. So his signature on the Secession Declaration is was imperative. Having a man of his stature sign that document was one of the main reasons that it, you know, eventually was pushed through. Um, his house on Wofford's campus was designed to have servant houses in the back where enslaved people likely lived. And Carlisle owned at least nine enslaved people according to the 1860 slave schedule, likely including a woman he purchased named Nancy for $175 in 1857, shown in the receipt above. The handwriting's a little difficult to read, but. And now for part two, I'm gonna pass it off to Destiny and Deanne. Thank you, Aaliyah. <clears throat> okay, so part two. Um, once, uh, once again, um, I focus primarily on information from the 60s um, and the 70s. So this is a period of integration. So let's start off with Black workers on campus. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of documentation as far as their names, uh, which speaks volumes, right? 
Um, also, whenever these folks were um, mentioned in the yearbook or in photographs, typically there was the title of boy or uncle, which was used as a tool of oppression um, in order to belittle Black men. Um, so that's just important to recognize. But we do have some names listed at the bottom here that we were able to come across. Um, there was a period um, at Walford that women were allowed to attend um, in the late 19th century. Um, it was like an experiment and that quickly ended by 1904. But here are some women that we highlight. Um, and then eventually in 1973, we have Janice B. Means, who is the first African-American woman to graduate from Walford College. So an important part about this research was making sure that we incorporated um, what was going on in society, not just focusing primarily on what's happening on Walford's campus. We wanted to make sure we tied in um, the rest of the world and the lynching of Willie Earl in 1947 is important uh, because that occurred in Greenville, which is what an hour away from Spartanburg. Um, and that, that caught a lot of tension or attention, excuse me. Um, and the Spartanburg Herald Journal covered it, but it also got national attention. So this is the racial violence that was being experienced during this time. So this information right here, um, this is prior to integration. In 1961, um, there were two Walf Walford students who went down to Orangeburg, South Carolina to participate in demonstrations, um, anti-segregation demonstrations. And there was a lot of backlash when those two students returned. Uh, they were two white men from the North, and when they came back, um, many Wofford students were enraged that they supported anti-segregation demonstrations. And these Wofford students, as you can see in this article below, um, set a cross on fire on the stairs of Old Main. And what's interesting, because I had the privilege of reading this news article, you have people supporting uh, this type of behavior. You have uh, local people, local people from the community saying things like these are just young men um, blowing off steam before exams. And so this was acceptable. And these people were throwing racial epithets and telling these two students to go back because they were against racism. So, <clears throat> so integration at Wofford in October, 1963, President Charles Marsh announced that the college uh, would grant admissions to all qualified students, regardless of race and creed. Interesting enough, though, this wasn't something that was advertised, right, or broadcasted. Wofford really didn't make this known. They just, and we'll get into why that was a thing, but um, yes. And then moving along, Wofford was the first private college in South Carolina to integrate, which is interesting. So, um, and then a Spartanburg native, Al Gray, was the first black student accepted to Wofford. Um, and we'll talk about him later on. So, so a little more about integration. Of course, that came with backlash and support. Um, plenty of people were against it. Plenty of folks were for it. And you guys can look at these snippets right here um, letters addressed to Dr. Marsh um, talking about the backlash and the support. So, and this is also more backlash and support. Okay, um, these are board meeting notes on integration and Keisha did a lot of this work during January, but what I was referring to earlier um, why Walford didn't necessarily advertise. If you can look at this for a moment, it says the possible adverse effects if Negroes are admitted. Um, if you look at all six of the reasons, or if you look at all six of the effects, you see that they have financial reasons behind them, right? You see grants, you have loans, you have scholarship. So there was um, an incentive to integrate, um, but 
not necessarily people wanting those students to be on campus, so. So Albert Gray, um, a graduate, um, the first black student admitted, but graduated in 71. So he, once again, is a Spartanburg native. He went to Carver High School, not far from here. Um, he had to leave Walford for a little bit because he went off to join the war, the Vietnam War, but he did come back and did graduate in 1971. Um, so Douglas Jones is the first graduate um, and also a Spartanburg uh, native who attended Carver High School. Um, and I had the opportunity to transcribe his interview with Keisha, where he talks about his experience at Wofford. And while he appreciates Wofford to an extent, it was quite challenging, you know, it was difficult to deal with uh, the racism on an everyday basis. And he talks about that. Um, but he, in also in this interview, he went on to talk about um, being a part of the NAACP youth chapter. And that really um, got him interested in the civil rights movement because I think a lot of folks forget that the civil rights movement didn't, it did not bypass Spartanburg. It was definitely here. And he was a part of that change in that movement. That's a, a reason why he wanted to attend Wofford um, to bring about change, so. Okay, so here are some of the experiences that he talked about in his interview, and I'll let you guys look at that a little bit, but at the very bottom, I'll read one out. He mentions, I carpooled to Fort Jackson with a white student and a car pulled out in front of the white student, and he said that effing N-word. He apologized to me, but the thing about it, the damage was already done, and I think a lot of people fail to recognize that words can be just as damaging and harmful um, and um, it wasn't rare for these hurtful terms, these racial epithets to be thrown at Douglas, as you can see on the screen. Here's some more uh, information about his experience. Um, an important part right here is after I left Walford, I didn't even want to set foot back on Walford's campus. I wouldn't even drive down Church Street because I didn't even like to drive by Wofford because it would bring back memories, um, which is unfortunate. Um, he eventually went on to talk about that. The only thing that brought him back to Wofford is just knowing that the fact that he came to Wofford, he brought so many opportunities to black students um, today. He opened a door and he was appreciative of that, but it, it was rough for him to say the least. And there's a picture of Al, and, um, Al Gray and Douglas Jones at the bottom. And I'll pass it on to Destiny now. Thank you, Deanne and Aaliyah. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, so as Dr. Liebrich touched on at the beginning, my research focused on um, the 80s onto present day. So this was, this is a little bit of De'Aaron's research, but this is um, some snippets in the paper discussing the student, student, black students experience at Wofford. So I'll give you a second to do that. Now here we have some um, first at Wofford, some African American first, as long along with in the sixties. In the sixties, we had an increase of recruit black student recruitment at Wofford, and then in nineteen seventy, um, Bobby Leach was appointed the first African American administrator at Wofford College, and then in seventy two, Bishop Bishop James S. Thomas was the first African American student to receive an honorary degree. Then Dr. Otis Turner was the first African-American professor at Wofford College between the years of 72 and 77. Then as De'Aaron spoke about earlier, Janice B. Means was the first African-American woman to graduate from Wofford College. In 1970s, the Association of African-American Students and the Gospel Choir were formed on campus to meet the, need, the cultural needs of African-American students. 
In 79, a citywide Delta Sigma Theta sorority incorporated char uh, charter was chartered on Wofford's campus by 10 African-American students. Um, there were some affiliated with Wofford, some affiliated with Converse, University of South Carolina, and um, Upstate in Limestone. And then and today in 2020, Wofford College has four full-time tenure-track African-American faculty and staff. Faculty. So here are a few yearbook photos from the years of 1960 to 1980s. So on our top left, we have from 1960, page 25, we have a picture of a white student on campus and the caption or the snippet at the top says a plantation owner at Wofford, question mark. So then on our top right, we have a couple of students who um, look like they're just pointing a certain direction, talking to a black, ch a black child. And then at the very bottom, we have a student on campus waving a Confederate flag. And then the um, bottom right, we have a photo from the 1981 yearbook. Um, this is students on campus mimicking um, the KKK and dressed as um, blackface. So now we have some faculty led initiatives on campus. So in 1972, Jer Dr. Jerry Ginocchio, Department of Sociology uh, created several courses related to race and racism in, in the United States. Um, he created um, and co-taught the sociology and race and ethnic ethnic relations. He also created um, courses with Malcolm X that involved Malcolm X, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Dr. Uh, W.E. Du Bois. So in 1981, the um, intercultural studies was, sorry, intercultural studies was found by Dr. Thurman. Then uh, 95, the Latin American and Caribbean studies was brought to campus by Dr. Griswold and Dr. Camille Bethay. And then in 2005, we have the African American Studies Program brought by Dr. Jerry Ginocchio and Jim Neighbors. And then again in 2005, we have the Gender Studies Program by uh, Karen Goodchild and Dr. Sally Hitchmo. And then in 2015, we have the Asian American Asian uh, Studies Program by Dr. David Eford. And then in 2015, we have the um, Middle Eastern and North African Studies by doc, uh, Dr. Carol, uh, Courtney Doral, excuse me. Then at the bottom, this is a picture of the student researchers along with Dr. Liebrick and um, Dr. Bethay at doing at one of the museums. <clears throat> So now this is a photo of the Black Alumni Summit in 2015, which was started the homecoming of 2013 by the class of 83 on their 30th reunion. This, um, the summit was brought to our campus to um, support minoritized students on campus while also um, creating support and um, raising money for various causes on campus. So as I said, the first uh, Black Alumni Summit was brought to us in October of 2014. Wofford Today now has um, a host of organizations that support um, BIPOC students on campus. Um, some of those are the Association of Multicultural Students, Black Student Alliance, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, the Organization of Latin American Students, the Wofford Asian, Asian, Asian American and Pacific Island Student Organization, Wofford Men of Color, and Wofford Women of Color. <clears throat> so now talking about um, more recent things as far as student activism on campus, we have the Wofford Anti-Racism Coalition. So in the summer of 2020, this past summer, um, national and global protests and organization, organization against racial injustice was sparked after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among other African Americans who were victims of police brutality. With members of universities, colleges, business, and other organizations across the United States speaking out against racial injustice and using their platform to education and lead, um, a group of Wofford students teamed up to speak, out their speak about their frustration at Wofford's ongo ongoing institution structural racism, which formed the Anti-Racism Coalition. So several letters and our list of grievances and demands was created by the coalition and then we have the um, 
protest that was held October 1st of 2020, hosted by the coalition Wofford Men of Color and Wofford Women of Color. And this is a photo of myself and Naya Taylor being interviewed the summer of 2020 um, about the coalition. Then we have um, some student activism as on social media. So we have the Black at Wofford page. Um, this was also started in the, the sum, this past summer. And this page is a platform for students, alumni, faculty, and staff to share their testimonies that relate to um, experience racism on our campus today. And um, this page gained over 2,000 followers in just less than a week. So there's that. And we also have the old gold and black, which highlight, um, which continue to speak about the things that happen on campus as well. <clears throat> These are just a few photos from the protest that was held by the coalition Wofford Men of Color and Wofford Women of Color. Had a huge success. Now closing our research, we have a few recommendations that we um, we kind of came up with and saw as we were um, conducting this research and talking amongst ourselves for the Wofford. So for the Wofford administration and board of trustees, um, we recommend that you all meet with and listen to and learn from a wide variety of students, including members of the coalition, faculty, staff, and people involved in anti-racism work, anti work on campus. Um, we also recommend that you financially support independent, co independent collaborative student and faculty research related to racial, um, racial justice and campus landscape. Doing this would include changing building names as Aaliyah touched on. It would also include adding more plaques or statues that commemorate Black history and other BIPOC individuals or groups. We, um, in the Coming Street School, a recommendation that we had was create a museum out of that building, preserving the history related to system systemic racism and civil rights in the upstate. We recommend that racial justice in curriculum and educational practices. So funding a research team of students and faculty dedicated to a five year in depth research project on Wofford's campus. This would also include funding an archival dig on campus, <clears throat> funding a faculty staff research at women on women at um, Wofford, Title IX, Latinx history, Asian and Asian American history, indigenous, first peoples, Native American, Asian Native American history, excuse me, and um, the LGBTQIA plus history. Then this would also include providing a space for more conversations about decolonialization and uh, things of that nature. This would include updating Wofford's history uh, website, Wofford's, Wofford College's website as a whole, and inviting more Black alumni to share their stories with students in the classroom. In a couple, I can't really see the last couple of bullets because I have the screen share thing, but we have um, reviewing an institute, institutional investment and institutional partnerships, evaluating relationships with current donors, and more money channeling to student faculty led work. So that concludes our research um, from the past 10 months. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, sorry didn't want to miss this. But we have a few thanks um, to a list, a long list of people and organizations that um, contributed to our research that we just like to thank. And um, of course, thanking you all for being here tonight. So I will stop my screen share and hand it back over to Dr. Liebrick. All right. Thank you so much, Aaliyah, De'Aaron, and Destiny. Um, I cannot stress enough how um, amazing it has been to work with this team of researchers. Um, I don't think that um, we could ever do justice to what they've done for our campus in these past 10 months. Um, we certainly can't do it in an hour. So I am so grateful to all of you all. Um, you've all taught me so much and I just, I really learned working from you all and it's been um, a wonderful, an emotional, but a wonderful project. And I thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and thank a few other people. And while I'm reading our thank yous, if you have questions you would like to ask, please type them in the chat box and I will make sure to read them to our student researchers. 
um, in a panel-like format in the last few minutes that we have. So um, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I don't forget anyone. So um, again, thank you to the student researchers. Um, with Working with them has just been such an amazing experience and the highlight of my teaching career so far. Um, going to Alabama with them, um, I'm going to cry if I keep going, but going to Alabama with this group of researchers was probably the highlight of my entire teaching um, career so far. They taught me so much. I just felt like we've learned so much. The conversations we've had, the information we've gone over. And again, I think we all acknowledge that to do this type of work justice, it would take five years of intensive research going through every single box, every single book um, in the Wofford archives. Um, but I think that for the 10 months you all had, you exceeded all expectations that I ever had and blew me out of the water with this project. And I can't thank you enough. Um, so again, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, I will repost our booklet that you can download as a PDF. And um, if you would like a physical copy, please email me. Um, so I'd like to thank the following individuals who have been instrumental in making this project happen. Dr. Tasha smith Tyus. Mr. Luke Marr, Dr. Philip Stone, Mr. Brad Steinecke, Dr. Trina Jones, Dr. Camille Bethay, Dr. Kim Rostin, Dr. Kenneth Banks, Ms. Jessica Holcomb, Dean Taifa Alexander, Dr. Laura Barbas Roden, Dr. Jerry Ginocchio, Dr. Jim Neighbors, Dr. Kimberly Hall, Ms. Jessica Scott Felder, Dr. Sissy Fowler, Ms. Jesslyn Story, Ms. Rebecca Parrish, the Office of Undergraduate Research, the, de de ugh, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Spartanburg Public Library, the Council for Independent Colleges, and all of those of you all who took time to meet with students, be interviewed, come to our roundtable discussion, and otherwise contribute, especially during a global pandemic. And thank you all for being here so much. And I just wanna give our student researchers a round of applause. Um, we have a few questions, so I am going to read those. Um, so the very first question, um, oh wow, these are really good, um, okay. So first question, um, hold on. you all are getting to see how I teach online, which is a lot of clicking the wrong buttons and then going, ah, um, but okay. So this is one question. What was the hardest thing to learn about the history of Wofford? The hardest pill to swallow during these past 10 months? Um, I can go ahead and begin that one. Um, I think the hardest thing for me wasn't just one specific fact or one specific piece of information about a specific person. I think the hardest thing for me was knowing this information and then it not being known by others. And so for me, it was me finding out this information and then I'm like, y'all don't know about this. And so that was one of the hardest things for me and um so yeah <laughs> yeah i would agree and just to kind of piggyback off of what destiny was saying i think you know similarly considering the historical context like the socio-historical context it's not hard you know obviously to believe that white men with money that work in higher education might have owned slaves might have been pro-slavery or that even that the college was built by slaves because most universities were and most colleges were most people working in higher education at that time owned slaves but I think like Destiny said the most difficult pill to swallow was knowing that and then telling someone that and then having them question that or even knowing that and then like not being able to share with other people and hesitation or fear of having to get into an argument with someone questioning the work that we've done. Because I think, honestly, when you consider the historical context of it, it's not hard to believe. But I think, like, just not getting that recognition sometimes was very difficult. 
I completely agree with uh, Aaliyah and Destiny. It was the, the pushback. Um, it always shocks me. Thank you all for sharing that. I think building off that, exciting. We've gotten a lot of people wanting to do questions, asking how they can get involved in this research from other students. Um, how did you, I think building on that question, how did you all take care of yourselves during, do, uh, doing this research and during this project? Yeah, I'll hop in here. Um, it was hard. Um, I, I think when I started this back in January, that was probably the darkest times um, because the information was fairly new. Taking care of yourself consists of speaking to people who are like you. So I think during that time, I spoke to plenty of Black women on campus. I needed that support, right? Um, and then making sure I had stepped away from the work, right? I was just engulfed in it and I needed some time to step away, whether that's taking breaks from the research for maybe two days, but truly taking breaks. And I think for me personally, I was kind of the opposite. Um, like it was definitely times where it was difficult, but I think the times when it was difficult were the times when I wanted to talk about it the most with other people, um, whether that was like calling my mom to talk about it or um, alumni that like I knew that I felt like would maybe be interested or like want to know more about my project. So I think like that part um, kind of helps a lot. And then also like even the people that I was working with, like talking to them about like our research findings and um, just kind of having those moments where we could like share with each other and just kind of like listen to each other and talk about how it's making us feel, especially I remember like in Alabama, when we went to the Justice and Peace Memorial, it was like, we all kind of needed a second to just kind of be with each other and like sit in that and like reflect on that. So I think like being around people similar to what De'Aaron said um, helped a lot. Yeah, um, I can echo that as well. For me, it would, um, I would have to just take a couple of days off, take a couple of hours off and just um, kind of separate myself from the research and um, like the, my outside life. And so being able to like talk to my dad about the research, but also being able to talk to him about something random was how I um, coped with all of this and just being able to talk with Aaliyah and De'Aaron and um, Dr. Liebrick and Dr. T. So, yeah. Thank you all. Um, Another question, was there any interest in, do, when you were doing your research, was there any interest in erecting a Confederate monument on our campus? And if so, when was that and what happened? So I'll take that because that's my area of the research. Um, basically, if you wanted to look up that part of the research, it's in the Wofford History Book. Um, there were talks of building a Confederate monument after the war. Um, probably 10, five to 10 years afterwards was when like funds were raised, but the statue was just never built, it was never erected. Um, don't really know why. Uh, I'm glad they decided not to, um, obviously, but those conversations did happen. But like I said, if you wanted to know more about that in specific time frame, I can't really give you a specific year um, or month even, um, but you can look that up in the Wofford history book, it's in there. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, and on that, we do in our booklet, um, if you want to download that, and I'll make sure to repost it. If you go back up, it's at the very beginning of the chat, and you can download the booklet that the students created. Um, but there is a page on the lost cause that talks about that history um, in Spartanburg more generally, and a little bit on Wofford's campus. So that idea of the lost cause. And we did find some on that. Um, let's see. One, I think we have time for one last question. Um, what would you do, looking back over this research, um, what would you do differently? Nothing. <laughs> um, I, nothing. I don't really think I would change anything. Obviously, this would have been preferably 
not during COVID, we may have been able to find more stuff in the summer if we would have been able to actively be in the libraries, but obviously that's out of our control. But considering that, I don't really think that there's anything I would change. I wouldn't want to work with a different group of people. Um, the professors that helped us were great. All of the organizations that helped us were great. Like, I think that different avenues that we took to compile all this stuff also was a huge part in why I enjoyed this project so much and why I think it was so beneficial to the campus. So the short version, nothing. <laughs> you can go ahead, Destiny. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I think up to, I mean, to now, I think it's very, it was very successful. Um, like Aaliyah said, the group of people was very successful. Um, yeah, I don't think I would, except for COVID, of course. I mean, I can't really change that, but yeah, I don't think I would change anything. Yeah, I concur, ladies. I think the only thing I would have done differently is prior to interim, I would have done more research on what public memory looked like. Um, I would have spent more time maybe um, looking at what Furman did, right? Just getting a little more reference, just to have a little better understanding and background coming into it. But really, I wouldn't have done anything different. I'll chime in. Um, I agree. I think we all jumped into this project not really knowing what we were getting into. Um, and I just, I can't thank the students enough. I also want to just, again, thank um, Luke Marr, Philip Stone, and Brad Steinecke, um, who are archivists and librarians, who when we sent them questions, um, can you find this document? Can you help us find this newspaper article? Um, we're able to get that to us. So a special thanks to you all and to Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith Tyus for um, just being there and helping us along. Um, Dr. Bethay, Dr. Smith Tyus spent this summer uh, working with these students, talking, debriefing, and I just, I cannot thank you enough because I don't think that I was in a, I mean, I can be there and I can listen, but there are certain things that these students felt that I just, I can't feel as a white woman. And I just, I cannot thank Dr. Smith Tyus enough for her support um, and being there. And we have more questions, but we have one minute left. Is there anything else that you, the students would like to add? Um, I just wanna share that a lot of people have written congratulations. Um, I had it set, we weren't sure kind of what questions we would get, so we set it where they would just come to me. Congratulations, excellent work to the students. Um, so, and we've had some excellent questions and I will share them and try to respond to each individual. Um, but I hope, um, that this work will continue. Um, we wanted this to be the beginning of a conversation, not the end. I think that this work is just beginning at Wofford College um, and that these students have put, Woff I mean, these students have given their time and energy to create something very substantial for the college to build off of. And I don't think that the institution can ever thank them enough. So thank you all so much for being here. If you have questions for me, um, my email is libricra at wofford.edu. Um, and I'm also happy to um, pass any questions you have for the students along. I hope you'll read our booklet. If you would like um, a physical copy, please let me know. Those will be available at the beginning of next semester. You'll see them around campus. Um, and if you want one um, and you don't have one, just send me an email and I'll put my email in here. So thank you all so much. I'm gonna give another round of applause to the researchers. And to Keisha, who's not here, but in working on her MBA. So um, thank you all.